Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of Island Uplift's History Class. Now, in this series, we will attempt to do a walkthrough of the Caribbean Secondary Education Certificate or CSEC Caribbean History Syllabus. Now, in doing this syllabus, it's important for us to understand that the syllabus consists of um, a group of core topics. And from those topics, there are certain themes that we need to learn. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore those themes and we're gonna explore them chronologically in this series so that you can understand and follow and you could even use it as a study guide. Now, you heard that I mentioned that there are themes that you need to look at. And if you see on your screen here, these are the nine main themes that we will be covering in this walkthrough of the CSEC Caribbean history syllabus. Mm -hmm. So the indigenous peoples and the Europeans part one. Today, we're gonna be looking at Caribbean nature and migration patterns, Caribbean nature and migration patterns. So I hope that you're ready to do this walkthrough of the CSEC syllabus. So let's begin, all right. Now, for our lesson today, these are the objectives that we want to know. First of all, we should be able to describe the nature and the different subregions of the Caribbean. Then we want to be able to describe the migratory and settlement patterns of the indigenous peoples in the Caribbean up to the arrival of the Spanish in the year 1492. And in describing the migratory and settlement patterns, we want to be able to describe the migration of the indigenous peoples to the Americas and the Caribbean regions, taking into account their journey through North, Central, and South America, as well as their interactions. And then, of course, we want to be able to identify the geographic location of these three people groups, the Taino, the Kalinago, and the Mayan. So let's get into it. Now, before you here is a map of the Caribbean region. All right, now notice that I said the Caribbean region and I didn't just jump and say the Caribbean islands. It's very, very important because when studying history, one of the most important things that you have to know is the concept or the term known as the Caribbean region. Now you may ask what really then is the Caribbean region? The term Caribbean region refers to all countries surrounding and within the Caribbean Sea. It stretches from Bahamas in the north to Guyana in the south. That's right, to Guyana in the south. And French Guyana in the east to Belize in the west. So right there you see that we are including both islands and mainland territories. Now, many persons would think that the Caribbean only consists of the archipelago of islands running from the Bahamas to Trinidad and Tobago, but those islands are known as Caribbean islands. However, the term Caribbean region, it refers to a larger area, and this is very important to note, a larger area that is geographically, historically, culturally, and politically determined. So because of these four factors, this is why, for example, even though the coast of Colombia would border with the Caribbean Sea, Colombia would not be classified as Caribbean because identifying the Caribbean region, it entails considering geographic, historical, cultural, and political factors. Now, the Caribbean region is made up of five main terrestrial subregions. And of course, when we say terrestrial, you know that we mean land. All right. So we want to look at these five main terrestrial subregions. And the first subregion is called the Greater Antilles, which is made up of Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Haiti, which together form Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and of course, Jamaica. The second terrestrial subregion is called the Lesser Antilles, which run from the Virgin Islands in the north to Trinidad and Tobago in the south, Barbados in the east to the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonet, and Curacao in the west. And then we have the Bahamas in the north, which is our third terrestrial subregion. And then our fourth terrestrial subregion are the Guyanas, the mainland territories of the Guyanas and South America. We have Guyana, which historically was British Guyana, Suriname, which was Dutch Guyana, and of course we have French Guyana, all right? 
And then our last terrestrial subregion is the country of Belize, which is located in Central America. And in this lesson, you would hear that I would refer to Central America as Mesoamerica. All right. So just wanted to bring that out. Now, the Caribbean region is not just made up of terrestrial subregions, but it is also made up of a really big maritime region, popularly, popularly known as the Caribbean Sea. Now, the Caribbean Sea has helped to shape and transform Caribbean history, but the Caribbean Sea didn't act in isolation. Because along with the Caribbean Sea, or walking along with the Caribbean Sea and shaping the history, were the trade winds. Now, the trade winds are the reasons why ships and hu general human traffic from other parts of the world were able to come over to the Caribbean, thereby impacting this region. And along with the trade winds, the Caribbean region also had the help of ocean currents, ocean currents that would have helped with the movement of people groups from not just only from Europe and West Africa, but also from South America and Central America and even North America. So because of these geographical features, you realize that people groups were able to get to the Caribbean with, I guess you can see relative ease. All right. So it's just showing how these factors would have really helped in shaping the history of the region. So now that we have a good idea of what we mean by the Caribbean region, we want to look at the migration and settlement, and settlement pattern sorry, of the indigenous peoples that first came to the Caribbean. Now, the first inhabitants of the Americas, they arrived between 14,000 and 35,000 years ago. Now, there are two points of clarity we, we have to bring in. First of all, when we say the Americas, we obviously don't mean just the United States of America. But when we refer to the, the Americas, we're speaking about North America, Central America, South America, and of course, the Caribbean. All right. Now, when we say the first inhabitants of the America, um, the first inhabitants of the Americas, they arrived between 14,000 and 35,000 years ago. That's the other point of clarity that we have to bring about. Now, you notice that there is a range, and it's a very, very broad range, because these, the number of years, sorry, has been a point of debate. It still is a point of debate, but it's safe to say that within this range, we would have the correct number of years ago <laughs> that the first inhabitants would have actually come to the Americas. It would even be safe to say around 20,000 years ago the first inhabitants would have come to the Americas, all right? Now, this map shows human migration globally, and you would realize that humans started to migrate around 200,000 years ago from Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa. Now, specifically, major human migrations would have started from the countries, well, what we know as modern, the Ethiopia and Kenya, all right? Though this, these migration events, sorry, would have started going from one part of Africa, aka the eastern part, to the western and the northern part. And then you would have had migration movements that started moving into the Middle East. Now, as they move into the Middle East, these groups would have moved towards areas um, such as the Fertile Crescent, which is between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And of course, we know ancient civilizations would have started in those areas, such as the Sumerians, the Asmodians, the Phoenicians, and, and of course, eventually the Babylonians and the Assyrians and so on, all right? And then movements started, now please note, before I continue, the movements that we're seeing here, these movements are occurring way before advanced civilizations have started. All right. So these movements that we're seeing here are way before these ancient kingdoms and so on have started. These are just groups of people who are primarily hunter hunter gatherers who are just basically looking looking for refuge or looking for better prospects in land, etc. So they're moving. All right. 
So you have people groups moving to India, then they move to East Asia, Southeast Asia, down into Oceania and Australia there. If you go back, you'll see that there are people groups who are also started moving up into Europe. Now, we want to pay close attention to the people groups in East Asia, in the Chinese region here. There are a group of people who started going up from China, from East Asia, and they started making their way up to the tip here, um, to the very tip of Russia that is adjacent to Alaska. And if you realize that there is a movement of people groups going over into Alaska, thereby signaling the entrance of people coming into the Americas. Now, it's very interesting that they're able to make their way over here, taking into account that in our modern context, this is a very, very big waterway, all right? So we want to take a look at this and, and take a look at how this movement, how they were able, sorry, to achieve this movement. Now, first of all, when the first groups of people entered into the Americas, the period in the Earth's geological history known as the glacial period was going on. Now, the glacial period has a more popular name. It's also known as the Ice Age. Now, if you look on the map before you, you would realize that huge chunks of North America, Europe, and Russian Asia, <laughs> they are covered in ice they're covered in ice now it would have been a cold time obviously but the ice would have created land bridges to what in our modern context are major water bodies so it means that many of these people groups would have been able to travel from one place to another walking over ice walking over glaciers and this was the case with the first groups of people that came to the americas so we see here a map, and it is in an orientation where the Pacific Ocean is facing us so that we could see this connection between Russia and Alaska. And if you look, they are connected by a landmass that experts have labeled Beringia, all right, naming it after, of course, the Bering Strait that exists there today. And these people groups were able to walk over this ice-covered landmass. All right, they were able to walk over this ice covered landmass into North America and thereby occupying the Americas, which is very, very interesting. All right. Now, according to genetic analysis, there could have possibly been three major migration movements to the Americas. The first one would have occurred over 14,000 years ago, where people groups started going directly into South America. And that's interesting because the first groups of people who entered into the Americas ended up going straight through North America, through Central America, onto South America. That's very interesting. The second, then there was a second migration event that occurred about 12,000 years ago where persons came back in, but instead of going all the way back all the way down, sorry, to Central and South America, these people groups decided to stay in North America itself. And of course, from here, you would have had the different Native Americans that um, exist in the United States. And then there was a third migration movement between five and 10,000 years ago, where per people groups who entered into the Americas, they would have ventured further north towards the Arctic region. All right, so that's very interesting, especially seeing that the first migration movement would have involved people groups that, that went straight towards South America instead of probably like staying like somewhere closer in the North. That's very, very interesting. All right. So here we have a map of Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. And we're going to use this to help us understand the movement of these people groups. Um, in a much clearer way. Now, first of all, we see that people groups started to move down into Central America. And the very fact that we're seeing people groups moving here, represented by the arrow, this is showing that this is in which one of the um, people movements? The first major people movement. All right. So this now represents people groups that are moving now from North America into Central America. Now, something interesting happens 
because there are people groups um, along this arrow who would continue venturing into South America, but everyone doesn't. Everyone doesn't. There are some people groups that stay in Central America. And you're probably wondering why, why didn't they follow? Well, they realized that the areas there in Central America, they were good for agriculture and general civilization development. So they were fertile lands. They had access to water bodies, to rivers, to lakes. The, the, the temperature was good. Um, the climatic conditions were stable. They were able to develop major crops and, and rare animals. And these pleasant conditions were conducive to advanced civilization development. And as we're about to see, very advanced civilization started developing in this Central American area, all right? But then now you also had people groups who continued venturing into South America. And some of these people groups would have stopped in the Cuscan region in Peru. And in stopping there, they would have also established their own advanced societies. All right, their own advanced societies. But then now you had people groups who started venturing even further south, thereby expanding the boundaries of this, this advanced society. And of course, in later um, lessons, especially when we look at the Cape syllabus, we will look at the advanced society that was formed there known as the Inca Empire, all right? But then something else interesting occurred where there were people groups, uh, well, some of the people started venturing down into South America. Some of these people groups started branching off and they started venturing into the lowland forested areas of Venezuela and the Guyanas. Now, interestingly, the lands here, it's not that they're not fertile, but they're not as conducive to civilization development as these other lands. So as a result, you would have realized that the people groups that occupied here, they would have been um, practicing hunter-gatherer lifestyles much longer than these people groups living in Central America and the Western coast of South America because these civilizations would have gone full-fledged into agriculture development and infrastructure development and establishing laws and government systems and, and so on and so forth, as opposed to these groups that were still hunter -gather, heavily hunter-gatherer based, all right? And you would have realized that there was that kind of disparity. There was the advanced civilizations and there was the not so advanced civilization because what happened here in these lowland forested areas, there were thick forests, all right? And access to waterways and so on was not as easy as the Central Americans had it, all right? So what happened is, they just didn't become as advanced as them, all right? And we'll get, we'll, we'll get back to this point. Now, in Central America, as we stated, there would have been advanced civilizations that rose up. One of the first advanced civilizations to rise up in the Americas was a group of people called the Olmecs, all right? Now, after the Olmecs, there, were, there was the rise of a group of people known as the Mayans. Now, both the Olmecs and the Mayans created very advanced, sophisticated civilizations. But the Olmec civilization, it ended. And years later, years later, we had the rise of the Aztec Empire. Now, this was an even more advanced civilization, and it covered even more land than the Olmec civilization did. The Aztec and the Mayans also existed in the same time range as each other. And in South America, there was also a group of persons who established a massive empire. It was known as the Inca Empire. That was massive. Now, interestingly, these people groups, there was no archaeological evidence to show that these people groups actually interacted with, with each other. So even though it seems that they're close, the Aztecs and the Mayans would have known each other. 
but it would have been difficult for the Mayans and the Aztecs to have known of the existence of the Incas. I mean, we don't know, maybe possibly there could have been, but there has not been any archeological evidence to show that, all right? And then now we're going back to our good friends who occupy the lowland areas in Venezuela and the Guyanas. And we realized something interesting started happening. But we'll come back to them in a while. Let's go back to Central America here. And you can see that I drew two arrows coming from Central America going over to Cuba. These two arrows represent the first migration movements into the Caribbean. Now you may ask, if the Mayans and the Aztecs are so advanced, why is it that people groups are going into the Caribbean now? Well, the thing is, these were two powerful empires and they were bent on acquiring land and, of course, acquiring slaves, right? Now, a lot of persons who were not a part of the kingdom, they didn't want to be caught in slavery. They didn't want to, they didn't want to be caught and as slaves to do the bidding of these kingdoms. So a lot of them sought refuge by leaving Mesoamerica. All right, that's what that is all the other name for Central America by leaving Mesoamerica and venturing into Cuba. All right, and this represented the very first migration movement of people into the Caribbean islands. Now, I'm not saying that escaping slavery is the only reason why they went. Because first of all, many of them would have also gone because they were seeking more food. They were seeking more land. Because what you need to realize is with these kingdoms, the Aztec and the Mayans, with the Aztecs and the Mayans occupying Central America, it meant that there would have been an increase um, level of competition for resources. So many persons who were living in Mesoamerica would have realized that that as time progressed, it probably would have been a bit harder to acquire food and land. And especially since you have two powerful kingdoms who are trying to acquire more and more land and more and more servants. You say, you know what? I need to look for a better way of life. So um, they wanted the prospect of more food, more land, more opportunities. So they migrated, all right? Just like what we do today. And Besides that, you know, sometimes you, you also have the desire to travel. You have the desire to travel. Well, many, many of these persons, it could have been, they were probably just following their human instinct to just discover new places, <laughs> all right? So it just could have been that. It just could have been that as well. But there was a second, there was a second migration event that occurred in the Caribbean, and this occurred from the Orinoco River, all right? into Trinidad and Tobago, into Trinidad, all right? Now, this actually clarifies a misconception that many researchers have had for years because some people, including myself, have always thought that the only migration movement probably would have been from South America and they would have just island hop, island hop, island hop until they get to Cuba, all right? Or probably the other way around. But um, archaeological findings and also genetic analysis has also helped to, to show us that the migration movements, that there were actually two major migration movements that populated the Caribbean, one from Mesoamerica into Cuba and the other from South America into Trinidad. Now we want to look at the people groups that came now into the Caribbean islands. The first group of people that came are people who were named and researchers have named that this was not the actual name they call themselves, the Casimiroid people. All right, now the Casimiroids, they entered into Cuba and then they followed by entering into Haiti or Hispaniola, all right? And then after this Casimiroid people, some years later, the Altoiroid people arrived from the Orinoco River they came up from the Orinoco River in their canoes and they entered Trinidad and they made their way up through the Lesser Antilles until they reached Hispaniola, the Dominican Republic side of Hispaniola. Now it means that, you see what happened here? The Casimiroid people and the Otoiroid people would have met in Hispaniola. Now this would have caused some conflict or this would have caused 
uh, a bit of interaction of some sort, all right? Because the Autoroid people eventually would have assisted in displacing the Casimiroid people. So this is an interaction we're seeing here, all right? But years later, many years later, over a thousand years later, you had the movement of a new group of people called the Saladoid people. And they also came up from the Orinoco River. But you, as you can see, they traveled even further than the Autoroid people before them. And they would have displaced the Autoroid people. And therefore, they would have occupied both the Lesser and the Greater Antilles. Now, check this out. After them came a group of people called the Barankoid people. Now, the thing is, the Barankoid people didn't really reach that far. They occupied Trinidad, Grenada, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, and they came up and they, they didn't even occupy all of the Lesser Antilles. But while they were occupying these smaller islands, there was the Saladoid people who were still occupying the Greater Antilles. All right, so let's venture up and see what's going on with the Saladoid people. Over time, groups of Saladoid people started migrating into the Bahamas, all right? Now, these groups of Saladoid people now, they were labeled as Taino people, and Taino actually means good nature or, yeah, like somebody who has a good nature or somebody who has a noble nature, all right? So they were labeled Taino people. So over time, they became known as Taino people. And the, and the Taino people, they started occupying the Greater Antilles and uh, along with the Virgin Islands and, of course, the Bahamas. Although the Taino people who occupied the Bahamas, they were known as Lucayan Arawaks or Lucayan Taino. And by the way, when we say Taino, we are specifically referring to the people groups that are popularly known as the Arawaks. And then there was one last migration movement that occurred, one last indigenous people migration movement that occurred in the Caribbean, and that is the Kalinago migration movement, or as persons would popularly say, the Carib migration movement, which occurred over a span of 200 years, ending in 1650. Now these, Kalinago people, they would have occupied most of the Lesser Antilles, all right? So these were the major people movements that occurred over time. And interestingly, this is showing us that by the year 1492, when the Spanish came to the Caribbean region, there would have been three major people groups that were living in the region. The Mayans, the Taino, also known as the Arawaks, and the Kalinago, also known as the Caribs. So to recap, people groups came to the Americas between 14,000 and 35,000 years ago. They came in three major migration movements, first to Central America and South America, and then to North America, and then to the North temperate and Arctic regions of North America. There would have been advanced civilizations that were formed in Central America, also known as Mesoamerica, primarily the Olmecs, the Mayans, and the Aztecs. The landscape was suitable for agriculture and civilization development. Also in South America, and although we didn't go in-depth into them as yet, but we just mentioned in them, the Incas developed over time in the Andean mountain ranges. Now, other groups who settled in the forested lowlands of Venezuela and the Guyanas were not living in situations that were suitable for, and I should put in the word, advanced civilization development. So that's just a little correction there, advanced civilization development, or as advanced, or as advanced as the Aztecs and the Incas and the Mayans, all right? Now they search for more food and agriculture possibilities, more land, safety from the Mesoamerican and Inca empires, and a general desire of discovery led them into the Caribbean islands. And after different migrations of different Am Amerindian people groups, by the time the Spanish arrived in the Caribbean, three main groups were present, the Mayans, the Taino, and the Carinago. So this has been part one of our study on the indigenous peoples and the Europeans. Now tune in next class when we will look at part two of the indigenous peoples and Europeans, where we will zoom in 
to the earliest Caribbean inhabitants. Now for this lesson, we will focus on knowing more about the Mayans, the Taino and the Kalinago. So this has been a history class. I hope to see you in the next one, but for now, class dismissed.